Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's session. This is Abbas Sabah, Key Account Manager of Asino Iraq. On behalf of Asino and this team in Iraq, we would like to thank you all for attending our pediatric live update webinar. I would like to, talk, to take this opportunity to thank you, thank the organizer, Dr. Mason, and our speaker for their time and effort to enrich our session. Please feel free to share your questions and comment in the Q&A part as we will have Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Now I leave the stage to our moderator, Dr. Aso, Assistant Professor at College of Medicine, University of Sinomania. Dr. Aso, the mic is yours. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Really, it's my privilege tonight to be a moderator for two uh, best speakers I know, Professor uh, Dr. Yahya and Dr. Jawad. Uh, really, thank you for the organizer, Dr. Maysam Youssef, and the Iraqi Medical uh, Association uh, with UK, and Achino uh, Company for sponsoring such a meeting. Um, really, I'm welcoming all the friends and colleagues joining now and joining ongoing in the ongoing sessions. Tonight, we have uh, this webinar related to respiratory issues in infant and children, and it will be in three panels. The first speaker, Professor Dr. Uh, Yahya Ithawi, uh, will deliver a talk on pneumonia at first three months of life. Professor Yahya is a consultant neonatologist visiting professor in neonatology, head of NICU and neonatal perinatal fellowship in Australia and Canada. Uh, Dr. Yahya, the panel is yours. Um, thank you very much everybody for the webinar, for the, invi for the invitation and for the introduction. And it's really my pleasure uh, to speak here and uh, to my um, sisters, brothers, friend, all the people that I love in Iraq. And always I love to help children of Iraq. And uh, today my presentation is true about uh, pneumonia in the first three months of life, but not, I'm not gonna give a new something, but my, my purpose of talk to deliver some messages. And I wish and I hope that people listen to my messages. So um, uh, uh, um, people need to know that uh, the proper use of antibiotics is vital when you treat babies less than three months and treatment of infection of the chest or what would you call it pneumonia uh, by antibiotic is not enough. The treatment with antibiotics is a partial. The full management is full management of the baby. And therefore there is nothing now called respiratory support unit. It is a PICU or an ICU, a pediatric or neonatal or whole body intensive care. So the objectives of today's talk is to speak about pathogenesis, pathology, epidemiology, Hello, response, microbiology, uh, clinical manifestation, diagnosis, treatment, outcome of uh, first three months pneumonia. And uh, then I hope at the end deliver some messages. I just joined, sorry, I just joined, thank you. Okay, Yahya, carry on, sorry. Okay, sorry about that. So uh, the pneumonia in the first three months of chest infection, three months, we divide it to early and late. The important thing to remember that bacteria is a principal pathogen in these two types. The route of acquisition varies depend on the type, late or early. Early onset, the definition is controversial. Some people say within 24 hours, others will say within three days, and some use the term within six days. So I'm going to use today 
a period of six days for purpose of this session, but that has no evidence. So early onset pneumonia, uh, either acquired from mother through three routes, either from the amniotic, infected amniotic fluid or from the placenta, or the baby aspirated during the birth process. Sometime the baby aspirate, but does not cause infection. It colonizes and later on causes pneumonia. Can be early, can be late. The one of the important uh, uh, fact to remember that colonization of maternal birth tract is enough to cause pneumonia in the first three months. It does not need that the mother being infected. And therefore, presence, for example, of group B streptococcus or GBS is sometime a cause of pneumonia in the first three months of life. Late onset pneumonia, which is pneumonia happened between seven days and three months, can happen in a hospitalized patient, but can happen in the community. Usually it, most of time, it arises from the uh, colonization of the hospital, whether the mother or the machines or the staff, but it also can be from nosocomial infection from individuals. And it can happen from contaminated equipment. The microorganism can go through damages or injuries of tracheal and bronchial mucosa, but sometimes it delivered from the bloodstream. The main mechanism of the most common cause of pneumonia, especially in uh, rich resources countries, is the GPS. And the main way of the GPS causing infection is the presence of beta hemolysine. It, this uh, chemical causes lung epithelial injury. It causes, it has the ability to form bores. And this bores increase permeability and causes edema and alveolar uh, uh, hemorrhage and causes the uh, damages to the lung. Uh, sometime, sometime the GPS, it's in the blood and goes to the lung, not through the lung itself. It's important to remember that surfactant is inhibitor to beta hemolysine. And therefore, a premature baby are vulnerable to GPS more than, even more than term baby, because they are either partially or fully deficient of surfactant, which means there will be no inhibition of beta hemolysine, and therefore it's either more common or even more severe. The pathology of the pneumonia in the first three months varies depend on the bacteria or viral. The main difference that you need guys to remember is the uh, blood supply, the hyperemia. The viral is hypoxic infection while the bacterial is hyperemic. And I need to deliver one message here. The ultrasound can pick that. X-ray will not pick that. So you guys need to remember that point of care ultrasound is the tool to differentiate between viral and bacterial. Because again, bacterial is hyperemic and then lead to what you call it hepatization. If you guys remember from medical school, while the viral is ischemic lesion. So that's why the bacterial pneumonia characterized by inflammation of pleura. We have visceral and parietal pleura sliding. When it become inflamed, there will be no sliding. And then you can pick that by ultrasound. There is also infiltration and destruction of bronchopulmonary tissue causing visualization of the bronchial tissue, but what we call it air bronchogram on ultrasound. There is leukocyte and fibrinous exudate 
within the alveoli and bronchi and bronchioles. And the bacteria often seen on uh, post-mortem or if there is a, a histopathology in the interstitial spaces, in the alveoli, in the bronchi and in the bronchioles. Viruses does not cause mainly to the alveoli. It causes mainly interstitial pneumonia. And it is infiltrative, inflammatory, not destructive. However, so for example, rubella pneumonia characterized by mononuclear cell and lymphocyte infiltration. Sometimes there is extensive inflammation and leads to hyaline membrane disease or hyaline membrane formation like RDS. Uh, Sometimes if it continue and not resolve and not supported, especially with the proper respiratory support, you got interstitial fibro fibrosis and scarring. And that's usually what happened in COVID-19. So what about how common the infection is? How, where? In rich resources countries, okay? The incidence is less than 1% in full-time infant. The re main reason is the presence of surfactant. So remember the importance of surfactant in pneumonia. While in Britain babies is 10%, not only the surfactant, but there are other factors. The incidence in the first three months of pneumonia at autopsy is around 20 to 30 percent of live born when they live and die, and it's about 15 to 38 percent in a stillborn. Congenital pneumonia, or the pneumonia that is present in the lung prior delivery, is is a very common cause of mortality and morbidity in very. Uh, in a small uh, and premature babies less than 100, 1,000 grams. And it account about 30% of death of these babies. The pneumonia that is uh, caused by the um, enteric organism uh, from the vaginal tract is uh, usually associated with chorioamnitis. And chorioaminitis is a lethal condition for this pronoun. Also, if not only sometimes you don't have chorioaminitis and people forget there is something called phanicitis or inflammation of the cord. Uh, usually, usually when you have chorioaminitis or phan phanicitis, then you have a congenital pneumonia or pneumonia in the uh, lung tissue prior expulsion of the fetus. Uh, pneumonia is a major con contributor to infant mortality in uh, uh, resources limited countries, in developed country. And WHO thinks that there is more than 9,000 deaths per year, uh, below five years, uh, uh, in, in a report in 2015. What majority of death is less than one year. And uh, um, in, in one study from India, from central India, mortality secondary to pneumonia in the first month is 2.9% of live birth, very high percent. Uh, uh, more than half of causes of death of pneumonia in children occur in newborn. The problem that in these countries, these figures are underestimate the problem because uh, these are only the recorded or registered uh, uh, death. But there are some death that is not registered and babies arrive death without autopsy. The, what is the risk factors that we are talking about? is prolonged rupture of membrane, more than 18 hours. And more than 18 hours only for bacteria. For virals, you need you know, even a few hours, such as four hours for herpes. Maternal amnionitis or phonicitis, preterm delivery because of surfactant. Fetal tachycardia is a grave sign. And maternal intrapartum fever, and both are signs of chorioaminitis. Assisted ventilation usually causes pneumonia because of improper ventilation or prolonged intubation. Uh, uh, and, 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 and it's most commonly associated with late onset pneumonia. Nosocomial infection is about four times more common in intubated uh, versus non-intubated patient. Other risk factors, rare, such as congenital anomaly of the airways, 
um, severe debilitating underlying disease, prolonged hospitalization, uh, neurological impairment, uh, especially improper swallowing and deglutition, and nozzle inf infection uh, uh, due to improper hand wash. If you, if you work in an ICU, hand wash, hand wash, hand wash. And other factors to prevent infection is the overcrowding. Uh, what is the micro? It's I, microbiology. It's either bacterial, viral, but it can be spirochetal, protozoan, fungal pathogen. Early onset pneumonia, the, uh, the bacteria, as in the late, is the most common. Uh, however, the uh, prevalence and the priority and the order of occurrence are different between early and late pneumonia. Uh, so what are the micropology from transplacental? You got mainly rubella, cytomegalovirus, herpes, mum, you can see it's mainly viral, toxoplasma, mycobacterium tuberculosis are important, tryponema, and listeria monocytogenes. While a delivery is more bacterial, group B streptococcus, E. coli, staphylococcus aureus, uh, more for nosocomial, klebsiella, other streptococcus, hemophilus influenzae, the non typeable one, Candida species in very small babies and in prolonged antibiotic use, chlamydia, ureoplasma, the uh, talk is uh, uh, very high on this type of bacteria. Amniotic fluid, aspiration, cytomegalovirus, herpes, they are need uh, enterovirus, they need very few hours, they don't need 18 hours to care. Listeria, especially if you have uh, meconium in a premature baby, remember this is listeria until approved otherwise. Uh, chlamydia trachoma, mycobacteria, group B streptococcus, very important in, 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 in amniotic, but not as important as in delivery. That's why clearing it from delivery will help. Uh, e. coli, hemophilus influenzae, and again, the uh, common talk is about urea plasma, ureolitica. Uh, what about nasocomial? Staph, whether it's MRSA or MASA. Uh, streptococcus, the cones, streptococcus epidermidis, GB, group B streptococcus, Klebsiella and other uh, 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 gram negative, uh, Citrobacter, and also Bacillus serras. If you got Bacillus serras, you're in a big problem because mostly you will lose the baby. Uh, virals, if in, in community acquired, uh, such as respiratory syncytial, enterovirus, herpes, mostly from the mother, candida in long admission and long antibiotics and other uh, and, to, and fungal infection. Uh, so what is the uh, 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 bacterial infection that is present in uh, both early and late pneumonia? Mostly aerobic, uh, but anaerobic also can present such as bacterial. From aerobic, mostly GPS it is the most common cause of early onset pneumonia. However, this is in resources rich countries, not the developing countries, not the resources limited countries. The prevalence might be different. So in, in, in resources limited country, the early onset mainly is gram negative E. coli, but the GPS is still there. Klebsiella, Staph aureus, whether MRSA or MESA, the most dangerous is the MRSA. And Streptococcus pneumonia can also, uh, uh, from the community acquired is common. Uh, 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 common cause of infection. Uh, less common are Listeria monocytogenes, fortunately, because it's a very killing bacteria. Mycobacterium tuberculosis are less common, uh, and both are also less. Although transplacental infection with uh, mycobacteria often result in liver involvement, however, it can cause pneumonia. Uh, the, 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 there is a possible link between ureoplasma, ureoliticum, to chronic lung disease. So people think that uh, uh, ureoplasma ureoliticum contribute to the chronic lung disease that develop in an intubated baby. And uh, 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 it might cause acute uh, decompensation, but also it can cause chronic problem. The, 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 this connection between chronic uh, lung problem and ureoplasma uh, are both documented in both in a small series and as well as big meta-analysis. The, uh, uh, the, the bacterial infection in babies less than 1500 grams. The chest X-ray feature of pneumonia occur within uh, seven days in those 
uh, colonize with ureoplasma ureoliticum. However, the uh, chest X-ray finding of ureoplasma ureoliticum in babies less than 1,500 uh, occur less in, uh, even if you diagnose it in the baby, uh, occur less in non-colonized infant. So infant with positive ureoplasma ureoliticum culture have a relative risk of 11 for oxygen dependence on 36 uh, weeks corrected gestational age, uh, which is not high. However, the, uh, uh, the, uh, um, the incidence or the relative risk is way higher at 28 days uh, post, uh, uh, post life. Uh, the efficacy, the problem, the efficacy against ureoplasma is of antibiotics is uncertain. So here's the treatment is not the, um, the antibiotics, it is the respiratory support. Uh, uh, and and, and the, the main antibiotics is erythromycin and the problem that some are resistant to erythromycin. The viral herpes simplex is, is common, especially from infected mother, and it mainly cause early onset. And as you know, the herpes is present in three types. It can be uh, uh, cutaneous, and it can be invasive debilitating disease, and it can also present as pneumonia. And usually acquired from the mother and uh, during birth. And the problem that it need very short, uh, and of course it depends whether it's a, 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 a primary or a recurrent infection and other factors, but also the uh, leaking and the birth process itself. So the herpes need only four hours, they don't need 18 hours to cause the infection. Uh, and and uh, the pneumonia occur in 33 to 54 of the disseminated herpes simplex. And uh, remember the earlier the occurrence, the more disseminated the herpes, the later is the less disseminated. And remember please to uh, consider it if you do ultrasound and you see ischemic changes, not hyperemic changes. Even if the history is not suggestive, and you have a debilitated, very sick patient, remember to start a cyclo. You don't need to start prophylactic unless you diagnose it. Now, other viruses can cause pneumonia, not only the herpes. There is adenovirus, enterovirus, and mumps. And remember, all they cause interstitial. They don't cause alveolar. And however, uh, 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 Congenital rubella and cytomegalovirus can cause fibrosing and scarring problem. Fungal infection is important in babies less than 1,000. So the recommendation to give prophylaxis twice weekly in babies less than one kilo. And also if you use prolonged antibiotics and if you are having a, an, a, an immuno uh, deficient baby or you have uh, some common problem in your NICU. And remember that pneumonia is very common when you have systemic candidemia. Other causes in other than fungal, you have congenital toxoplasmosis and syphilis. The late onset pneumonia is a little bit different. Uh, the colonization with organism of the, and, and the normal floor of the baby are different in late onset. And uh, uh, because we don't do much monitoring and uh, cultures and screening, uh, we have no much information of the community acquired uh, versus the hospital uh, acquired infection. But the most common organism are gram positive bacteria include Streptococcus pyogenes, Streptococcus aureus, both MRSA and MESA, and Streptococcus pneumoniae. Um, other bacterial uh, uh, can, can cause, but uh, there are some bacteria that have characteristic features uh, such as Streptococcus aureus and Klebsiella. They are not inflammatory like other infection. They are destructive. They have the coagulase that eat the tissue. So it causes extensive tissue damage, causes abscess, and it can release these parts to the pleura and cause empyema. Um, other bacteria that might, in the latent, might cause same characteristic and um, you know cause something called pneumatocele. And these are 
a list of, uh, uh, of them, such as E. coli, uh, Suratia, Enterobacter, and so on. The Citrobacter diversus frequently associated also with lung abscess, but it causes at the same time brain abscess. Um, um, other bacteria that is you know, lethal is Pacillus serrus because it causes necrotizing pneumonia, not only this, the destruction, but necrotizing. It causes, you know, and, and, and you can see already when we, when we talk is about inflammation and destruction. Uh, and, and, and the most common it, when you find it, look at your ventilators and your circuit. Chlamydia trochomatis uh, usually is latent because it have long uh, incubation period. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna, I think I have to pass. There, there are, uh, you know, in, in also late onset, there are virus, of course, viral, but it's different from early onset viral. There, there is more li, merely herpes, but here's the adenovirus, parainfluenza, rhinovirus, enterovirus, influenza, respiratory syndrome, and now of course the corona. Uh, they are usually present in healthy. They are usually more local respiratory problem than systemic. And they remember they are ischemic and usually they occur in the lower and posterior area of the lung when you do the uh, uh, lung ultrasound. Uh, uh, RSV is more common in winter months and it causes significant mortality and morbidity without proper uh, 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 respiratory support. Um, uh, some of them are also common in hospital acquired infection uh, because they um, comes from people having the infection without proper infection control measures. Uh, what is the clinical manifestation? Well, it's very uh, uh, varies, but it's mainly respiratory distress. But it can also have it can present at lethargy, apnea, tachycardia, poor perfusion. Sometimes it can uh, progress uh, quickly to septic shock. Um, uh, some may develop pulmonary hypertension, very important point to treat pulmonary hypertension. And people, when they treat pulmonary hypertension, they right away go to sildenafil, while the treatment of pulmonary hypertension is not sildenafil. It is respiratory support, sedation. It's not giving oxygen. Again, it is not giving oxygen and it's not giving anti pulmonary hypertension. It is respiratory support and proper sedation. You treat most 90% of pulmonary hypertension by doing this. And sometimes you need muscle paralysis and ventilation. Other signs is temperature instability, metabolic acidosis, abdominal distension. And you can see none of these are uh, peculiar to pneumonia because there are many other uh, non-infectious causes such as anatomic and developmental defect or uh, physiological and pathological disorder that can cause respiratory distress. So not only infection causes. So if your baby not responding, don't change the antibiotic. You know, I'm not saying it's uh, incorrect to change antibiotics, but that is not the problem. You know, once the baby not responding, change antibiotics. Now think of the cause before you change antibiotics. Um, um, late onset, however, the most important point, they come with apnea especially the uh, RSV, they come with apnea, tachycardia, poor feeding, abdominal distension, jaundice, emesis, and respiratory distress and sometimes shock. A ventilator dependent infant, all of a sudden you need to have increased oxygen requirement. So please remember oxygen are toxic. Do not give pure oxygen. If you need oxygen more than 40% for more than 15 minutes, then you do have a problem. You need to fix it either in you or in your machine, or you have a problem in your baby. You cannot give pure oxygen to a human being. You cannot give, the oxygen should be 21%. We human being cannot remove the radicals caused by oxygen. If you give pure oxygen, even to adult, he won't able to survive because we cannot detoxify the radicals by oxygen. We live in an environment of 21%. So if you need more than 40%, escalate your management. Do not give pure oxygen, even to adult. Give blended oxygen. Oxygen blend with medical air. Medical air will provide the flow and oxygen will 
So you should have a set and measured oxygen. Do not give a pure, pure oxygen from oxygen cylinder to the patient. So once you have increased oxygen requirement, think what is the problem, why it's happening. What is the diagnosis of pneumonia? It clinical, radiographic, and microbiological. Because the signs are non-specific, so any sudden deterioration of respiratory distress, think of pneumonia. But other causes is existing. There is no pneumonia alone in first three months. If you want to start antibiotics in first three months, exclude bacteremia. Do blood culture. And don't tell me we don't have blood culture in Iraq. Please do blood culture because we do all the hospitals that I visited. In Iraq, they do have blood culture, but nobody is doing it. Do not start antibiotics without blood culture. If you don't have, then refer to your patient. It is vital to exclude bacteremia before starting antibiotics. Culture should be any fluid in these babies. Not enough blood, but urine, CSF, secretions, swabs. Okay? And you can get from intubated secretions and gram, you can do gram stains, but please do not change antibiotics based on your gram stain. Uh, uh, you can also get the pleural fusion or peritoneal fluid. All you need to culture all these. Sometimes you don't need a, a culture. You have other means to diagnose such as uh, polymerase chain reaction and viral cultures. Chest radiography. Remember, not only x-ray, you have ultrasound. Most common x-ray changes are uh, 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 air bronchogram not like a lobar, very clear. There is irregular patchy bilateral, most of them. Pneumonia caused by GPS. In, in the preterm baby, it looks like RDS. In term baby, it looks like a TTN. So remember, TTN or RDS need to rule out. It's always correct to start antibiotics, but it's always wrong to continue antibiotics if you have no pneumonia or your culture is negative. You need to remember that. Uh, uh, presence of pleural effusion might be an evidence of uh, pneumonia that is present up to 70%. But remember, pleural effusion can occur in transient tachypnea, congenital heart disease, uh, hydrops fetalis, and uh, lymphangiectasia. Now, you need to remember something called point of care ultrasound. It is superior to x ray, it is diagnostic. It is easier to interpret than x-ray. It easily to be mastered. And it can diagnose virus versus bacterial and it can pick the complication early. So we do courses for lung ultrasound and if you are interested, you can visit our website. So the su successful treatment of first three months pneumonia is depend on the pathogen an early recognition, an early therapy before development of irreversible injury. And depending on the respiratory distress, the initial management is respiratory support, respiratory support, respiratory support, and respiratory support. It is not oxygen therapy, remember that. It is respiratory support, not oxygen because they have exchange problem. So you need to receive support. Providing oxygen is complication of the problem. You can provide oxygen for a short period of time until you provide a proper respiratory support and embark the best guess antibiotic therapy until you get the culture. The choice of the antibiotics is uh, depend whether it's early or late infection. And uh, uh, for purpose of this talk, as I said, uh, early is less than six days. I, I don't have evidence. The empiric is after doing the cultures. But when the specific anti specific antibacterial or pathogen are identified, you can switch and modify your uh, antibiotics depending on the susceptibility pattern. For early onset pneumonia, the best is ambicillin and gentamicin. 
Okay, and the dose depend on the gestation, the weight, the renal function, the postnatal age, and uh, 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 gestational age. Remember, ambicillin is effective against GPS. And all streptococci, including Listerium and Listeria monocytogenous, and some gram negative. And remember, gentamicin is effective against uh, gram negative. And remember, both are synergistic, so they help each other. The problem when the baby come from community, the gentamicin need to be replaced by amikacin. And the reason because most of community, because of the common use of gentamicin, unfortunately, there is resistance to gentamicin. So if you are from the community, switch and combine ambicillin with the amikacin, it would be the best guest therapy that you can do. Now, please don't change the antibiotics. Wallahi al-azim, ambicillin and gentamicin are very good combination. You don't need cefotaxin and you don't need meropinam and you, know, you don't need peptazo. You don't need these antibiotics. Ambicillin and gentamicin are the best combination gas therapy for early onset. When the baby deteriorates, you don't need to switch the antibiotics. You, the baby needs respiratory support. So uh, a third generation cephaloprotein is very effective but the problem is it has uh, resistance and generally uh, should not be used for early onset pneumonia or sepsis. Because all the cephalosporin, they got very easily resistance. And this resistance either is uh, inducible or chromosomally mediated inside beta lactamase activity. There are huge evidence that cefotaxin develop resistance easily. And giving gentamicin and ambicillin in early onset pneumonia is way better than cefotaxin. Switching to meropinum makes no sense. Giving vancomycin, if you have no central line, make no sense. So wallahi al-azim, ambicillin and gentamicin are very good a combinations. And if your baby deteriorates, it is not because of the antibiotics, it's because you don't provide a proper uh, respiratory support. Well, in the late onset pneumonia, the story are different. If you are from the community and you are more than six, then you probably might need to give vancomycin plus amikacin. Vancomycin is because of your staff and especially the fear you can use the uh, uh, cloxacillin and floxacillin for MESA, for methicillin sensitive, but sometimes there is uh, uh, methicillin resistance or the MRSA. That's why I, the best combination that I suggest for babies less than three months and they are coming from the community is to start vancomycin. And because of the common use of gentamicin outside the hospital, I think it's best to add with it amikacin, or it depends on the susceptibility in your area. Now, uh, 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 and the reason why I, I suggest not cloxacillin or floxacillin is because of the MRSA, as I said. Now, remember that the cones, the coagulase negative streptococcus, such as epidermidis or albus, uh, 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 might also resist uh, um, cloxacillin and floxacillin or penicillin in general. And therefore vancomycin to these organisms are also important, especially if you have a central line. Of course, the dosing depending on the gestation, the postnatal age, the weight and so on. Uh, because we have something called VRE or vancomycin resistant enterococci, and because we have the some staph aureus resistance also. The vancomycin should be continue if you undefy, if you have no alternative when uh, from your susceptibility. If you isolate ESPL, however, then meropinum is indicated. But do not use meropinum without having ESPL or extended spectrum beta lactamase producing organism. 
If you have risk of seizure, then change the meropenem to imipenem because the risk of seizure is less. Both of them are effective. And imipenem, of course, cheaper than meropenem. Uh, if you have an infectious disease specialist, that would be very helpful. Um, again, meropenem for uh, C, uh, ambicillin C beta lactamases or ESPL producing strain uh, are very good coverage. Uh, 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 and, and remember that amikacin are having some activity against these uh, organisms. So if you don't have access to these, you can give uh, amikacin. The duration usually depend on the organism, but most of common is 10 to 14 days. Viral infection, we have very limited, uh, uh, very limited uh, antifungal, anti, anti, antiviral, uh, other than few, uh, such as uh, cytomegalovirus and herpes, we have none. Uh, herpes simplex, uh, we start the intravenous cyclovir. And remember, not only if there is risk, but if your lung ultrasound showing ischemic changes, think of it. Uh, respiratory syncytial virus, we have the rabavirin, but it's not used for many reasons because only use in infected and because of the way of delivery and it is toxicity. So only use in high risk in, in uh, admitted uh, patient with respiratory support and very premature babies. Uh, what is the prognosis? A prognosis, un uh, unfortunately, is bad if without proper respiratory support and the uh, prognosis does not depend on the use of antibiotics, unfortunately. Uh, of course, the uh, mortality and morbidity increases with pre-existing uh, chronic lung problem and immune deficiencies. Uh, most, if in, in, in uh, rich resources country will resolve without most of babies. Remember the outcome depend on the respiratory support, not the antibiotics, not the oxygen. And you need a proper intensive care, whether it's an ICU or PICU. And remember, it is not respiratory support alone. It is pediatric support. You support all the system when you have a lung problem. For example, you know, providing t total parental nutrition. So what is take home message? Pneumonia is a very important neonatal infection and major contributor to mortality worldwide. It's less than 1% in term, less than 10% in Britain. Uh, 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 it usually have a various definition, whether it's early or late, but it's early ranging between 24, three or six days. Um, there are a large number, it can be bacterial, viral or fungal. Most common early is group B streptococcus in rich resources country, however, however gram negative, uh, uh, is also common in uh, 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 resources limited countries. Risk factors are prom, uh, amnionitis, and phenocytis, preterm delivery, fetal tachycardia, and maternal fever. And I think I'm going to stop here uh, because I'm going to repeat myself and I would love to receive question at the end in, in better way. But I want to say ambicillin and gentamicin are very good combination. If your baby deteriorate, no need to switch the antibiotics, provide respiratory support. And if you don't have, ask for it. And if you don't know, try to train yourself how to provide respiratory invasive or non-invasive. Respiratory support, respiratory support, and respiratory support. And ambicillin and gentamicin is the go. You don't need to switch to antibiotics unless you have blood culture or you have a real evidence of your uh, uh, offending organism. And again, if you want to learn point of care ultrasound, please, um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to provide the help. If you don't have to pay, I can do it with you, but without certificate, but I'm happy to provide online, uh, uh, how to use lung ultrasound to diagnose pneumonia and help these babies. And thank you very much. I appreciate your listening. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Dr. Yahya, really it was very informative and direct uh, uh, lecture. Um, thank you for your information and hope everybody can listen to you and apply it in the daily practice. Um, uh, I'm happy to present the second speaker, uh, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Majid Jawad, 
who, uh, who will deliver a, a talk on the cough in infant and ch in children when to treat. Professor Dr. Majid is a consultant pediatrician with special interest in cardiorespiratory medicine, uh, NHS, uh, and uh, he's a strategic, strategic regional advisor of MENA and an honorary uh, consultant, Royal Brompton uh, Hospital, London. Uh, dear Professor Dr. Majid, the panel is yours and you are welcome. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, so, and it's very nice seeing you again and uh, to see Professor Yahya and all of our friends. Um, uh, it's, um, Professor Yahya is hard to follow. It's very, he's, uh, he's uh, always evidence-based and, and an excellent speaker. Okay, so um, I was asked actually to talk Thank about uh, uh, to talk about upper respiratory tract infection, which I thought it is not very um, exciting to lots of uh, audience. Hence, I had to change it to cough in infant and children to follow Professor Yahya and make it uh, in a sensible sequence because he's talked about uh, about. Um, uh, infants the first three months, if you like, and neonate. So, um, to give it a flavor of excitement, you know, make it cough when to treat. Uh, at least th this will cover upper respiratory tract, lower respiratory tract, chronic and acute, viral and bacterial, etc. Can I show the screen now? Yes. Yes, please. Yeah. So, can you see my slide? Yes. Okay. Sure, we can see. So, um, the child chased the cuff went to treat. And um, these are the, uh, in short, the points I'm going to cover introduction, causes, the differential diagnosis, and management. Well, cuff is the commonest symptoms in childhood. This is the commonest. If any pediatrician hasn't seen a child with cuff, he must be not only not a pediatrician, probably. He hasn't been living on this planet, okay? Most cuff, acute cuff, are viral. But of course, you will come to know that this is not always the case. Chronic cuff, the daily cuff, is de defined as not just two weeks old, but there has been lots of debate about the duration, and they settled to probably three to four weeks or more than four weeks to make it chronic. Um, the commonest causes are the following, and I'm not going to go through, you know, the infectious, you'll have the bronchitis, bronchiolitis, pneumonia, pneumonia, and TB. Okay, whether it is viral or bacterial, of course, that's the infectious. The non-infectious, you know, you have lots of, you have asthma, you have foreign body inhalation, you have aspiration, uh, the contamination from above or below, that's sinobronchial or, or reflux, okay, or psychogenic. And please don't forget this. And don't tell me that you haven't seen some children who are uh, uh, under stress and they have psychogenic cough. But of course, it's a, a diagnosis of exclusion. So what's the characteristic of cough? Very much any condition is a History discipline. When you take history, you must also ask what's the nature? How long did it start to see whether acute or chronic? Whether or not it's a dry or not, okay, product. And if it is dry, is it barking like the croupy cuff, you know, and a tracheomalacia, which is the oh, oh, or a deep, uh, or also, habitual cuff can be sometimes like this. Okay, honking is a psychogenic, which is <coughs> only when it is mentioned. When it is mentioned in the consultation room and disappear at night in a child who's well with normal assessment and uh, and, and 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 lung function and peak flow, etc. And paroxysmal or with or with or without hoop are pertussis or perpertussis. As these are, which is, uh, you know, the, the uh, 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 as you know, with the, and then followed by vomiting or not, or subconjunctival hemorrhage, or in older children, it might not. Uh, but we still have every now and then children with 
uh, who have not been immunized or didn't take the immunization well, they have pertussis present to us. Chronic weight cough is a very, very, you know, you should always, you should always think seriously before you send a child with chronic weight cough without full assessment, including looking for clubbing and um, and, and chest wall deformity, chest wall deformities, and like Harrison Salkai also, and other and, and associated signs, because it may indicate suppurative lung disease, alveolar bronch, uh, you know, alveolitis, uh, uh, and all 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 chronic conditions, etc. Okay, now, especially in the morning when you have, for example, here in UK, for example, Western country, you have uh, you have uh, the 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 uh, cystic fibrosis or um, uh, or or, or Cartagenaire disease, you know, the PCD, for example. Okay, um, points when you look at you know uh, look at these um, uh, in the history uh, to give you an alternative diagnosis in the history when. When the cough is severe and doesn't disappear during a sleep, the time and cause when it's you know, variability, as I say, doesn't disappear at sleep, associated cold or not, relation to meals, okay? Um, sometimes some children, if they, if they feed and they are lying down and they start coughing, they might have the rare, for example, H-type fistula or reflux, okay? Sputum, of course, productive cough should be taken with the, you know, uh, consideration. Wheezing, you know, you know, when cough is associated with wheezing, um, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it means uh, small airways disease, such as asthma or uh, osmotic bronchitis. Age of onset, of course, the younger the, uh, the child, the less likely it is psychogenic or made up, especially if it is chronic, okay? ENT infection or associated nasal polyps, you know, associations these are, okay? Um, like in cystic fibrosis, chest deformities, as I said earlier, abnormal chest um, auscultation, like crackles or wheezes, evidence of atopy, tell you that this is an asthmatic, for example, or not, failure to thrive means that you have a serious association or either, for example, cystic fibrosis, malabsorption, etc., immune deficiency, all these IgG for and IgG subclasses deficiencies, etc., digital clubbing, we said, uh, a growth failure, which is part of the also uh, uh, failure to thrive, or growth failure as a small stature, and um, uh, uh, the demonstration of cough and observation. Um, of course, it is important, okay, when they demonstrate or then. So points in the history, we, we always ask for fever, of course, and I'm afraid there are studies saying that the higher the temperature in young infant, the more uh, percentage of bacteremia in these children. Journal of Pediatrics, Pediatrics 2 or 3, there has been lots of studies on this, the relationship of the fever and the high temperature, especially the higher the temperature. And when this is, for example, 39 plus, it, it indicates pneumonitis, for example, or pneumonia or bacteremia, okay? Upper airway symptoms, uh, foreign body, of course, I will come to this in more details, habitual vomiting, you know, and contact with TB or HIV. You must take history of contact. You should never forget this. Smoking or behavior, we tend to forget. And I'm examining the Royal College. You can fail the whole case for not asking whether partners are smokers. I'm talking about this uh, professor, he asked me to go through his uh, uh, group to teach MRCPCH, which I'll be very, very happy to go through all these courses, especially exams are now changing, and Britain are eager to take foreign doctors now. They are out of Europe, so they are very happy to take your MTI. So I'll be happy to teach and help you to pass the exam, hopefully. Um, possible allergens. So the, the higher allergens and, and family history of atopy, the, our personal atopy, the, the higher the incidence of possibility of, uh, of atopic cough, such as asthma, immunization status, of course, in, in pertussiform cough, okay, or things when you have not been immunized or, or pneumonia, 
and swallowing abnormalities when you have regurgitation or neuromuscular problems. So chronic cough examples, adenotonsillar or rhinosinusitis, okay, in upper airways. Others, asthma, cardiac failure, increased cough um, receptor sensitivity because of non-asthmatic uh, isophilic bronchitis and allergy, et cetera. Um, the contamination from above or below, uh, all esophageal and give you aspiration. And those who have a neuromuscular problems, please, please, those who have hypotonia or uh, muscular dystrophies or thing, they are, the killer is the respiratory infection, pneumonia, okay? Because they can't expect her. They don't have enough uh, respiratory effort, okay? Interstitial lung disease, is a is a, a, a sort of a heterogeneous uh, a, a group of, of lots of condition rare but important most of them give you uh, chronic well not most the, the uh, all give you chronic symptoms but uh, some of them there are this distinct uh, uh, points in the history such as HIV for example or without it family history or death in the family or, or uh, of course, without, of course, any uh, uh, other uh, uh, reason, but uh, they, they have a chronic cough, they have, they have clubbing, desaturation, and they have a risk of pulmonary hypertension, just mentioned by Professor Yahya in some, uh, so as the, of course, infants with the chronic lung disease now, a lot of them are, are surviving the neonatal, um, uh, the neonatal ventilation, et cetera, IPPV. Uh, uh, and infections, of course, with TB. This is a, an example of pH monitoring in a child with gastroesophageal reflux and give you, if it is more than, you know, 4% of the, you know, pH 4, to give you, for example, a, a child who, who might have recurrent pneumonitis or chest infection, usually right side because the right bronchus is more, uh, you know, perpendicular um, when they inhale. So as the form buddies as well, just to, uh, Give you recurrent chest infection, especially in those who have who have uh, neuromuscular problems, okay, or cerebral palsy, cerebral palsies. Um, the chronic cough, the separative lung disease. There are various immune deficiencies, of course. You know, when it is a chronic with the clubbing, you must investigate for immune and primary ciliary dyskinesia with nasal brushing. Recurrent pulmonary aspiration, you must ask about this, okay, to see whether there's a recurrent vomiting or, or, or choking during eating. So retain inhaled foreign body when the, when the history is abrupt, acute, choking, uh, cough, 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 and, and then subsequent wheezing or coughing uh, without any previous history. Chronic bronchitis, cystic fibrosis, as I said, wet. Uh, 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 morning cough with the failure to thrive, 85% pancreatic insufficiency, and congenital causes like the semitar, likely, you know, um, the uh, denomatous uh, type, which just mentioned by Professor Yahya, like, you know, the, the developmental anomalies of the lung, and of course, environmental, like to tobacco and, and, and other things. This is a child, for example, with dexocardia, a baby, okay? with dexocardia and situs inversus delivered there. So you would expect that this child probably at a high risk, not of congenital heart disease. This is in, in the MR CPCH come to you as a respiratory, not a cardiac. And then you will be caught that you missed the dextrocardia. Okay, and was delivered. And uh, this is uh, a classical case of PCD, the Cartagner, they call it, for example. You need to do uh, uh, nasal brushing for, um, for electron microscopy and spectrophotometry. Okay, and that's when you don't treat an older child, uh, uh, they end up with the bronchiectasis and the CT scan showed, of course, all the abnormalities and things. Um, other worrying. Uh, things we said neonatal onset, chronic moist cough, cough started and persists after choking episodes formed by the cough occurs during or after feeding. That's regurgitation or H type fistula, auscultation, auscultatory abnormal finding, cardiac anomalies, left to right shunt with hepatomegaly, tachypnea, 
chest wall abnormalities, immune deficiency, feeding difficulties, hemoptysis. Do I need to tell you that should be taken seriously? Even though sometimes simple, simple bronchitis can give you hemoptysis, of course, but the uh, you have to take a good history. And of course, sometimes when you have uh, bleeding disorders, you are at a low threshold. Neurodevelopmental abnormality, there's an association. And you have a chronic cup, you have to think of um, how to prevent it. That's why we do gastrostomy and Nissan fund duplication in order to prevent regurgitation and, and frequent aspirations. Okay. Recurrent pneumonias, you know, you have to take it with, you know, seriously. Um, and uh, well, immune deficiency or whatever, uh, or, or cystic fibrosis, etc. Finger clubbing, all these things are, are important. This is an example of a child who every time he feeds when he's lying down with milk, he's okay with solids. He starts coughing, coughing, coughing. That's the H-type fistula on bronchoscopy. Okay. And uh, the, there are atypical organisms which give you chronic cough with low-grade fever and rather signs which are not very, very uh, as high, uh, as, as bad as the uh, bacterial pneumonitis where you have, you know, the other bac classical bacterial pneumonitis, pneumonitis of Cytriptococcus or staph, uh, uh, okay, or pneumococcal or staph, which give you, for example, so between five and 15 years, one of the commonest is, is mycoplasma, chlamydia pneumonia in babies, and one of these, uh, uh, to be honest, um, sexually transmitted with the with the uh, 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 I uh, you know uh, ophthalmia neonatorum like type okay but usually start later after fourteen days or so Legionella um, chlamydia sticky okay and the uh, uh, and the pneumocystis carinae in HIV children okay and TB of course and this is a child with bilateral patchy changes, not typical of the acute pneumonia we see of Cetriptococcus, which you have to really think carefully with the, with some uh, early fusion, okay? A child with interstitial lung disease, chronic cough, wet, uh, clubbing, uh, give you bilateral changes. CT scan usually give you more information, usually present with tinge of cyanosis, but ox oxygen saturation is very important especially in colored children, difficult, sometimes hard, and, and you easily miss. Shortness of breathing, very important. They don't have exercise tolerance. Exercise intolerance, very important. Exercise intolerance. Not just in asthma, it just shortens in, in those chronic interstitial lung disease. Weight loss, of course, it ha doesn't happen in asthma, or clubbing, no clubbing or weight loss and asthma, uh, the chronic X-ray changes. Okay, um, that's the clubbing, and of course, the I don't I, I don't want to I stress more on the oxygen saturation, and that's uh, uh, when that's an empyema, of course. Okay, in a child, when when you have chronic changes and and phlegmy and stained phlegm, you have to think of. Uh, 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 you know, suppurative lung disease, OTB. Endobronchial foreign body, usually characteristic. And I'm afraid every now and then in Iraq, we have cases missed, okay, with the foreign body. And it can happen, uh, uh, ch children, uh, especially toddlers, they quite often uh, uh, put things in their mouth and, and then they choke up they, as they are ex excited or running. And then they cough sometimes, and the cough disappears after 10 minutes or so. And they have, have uh, so sudden onset of symptoms, ask specifically about possibility of choking or aspiration with no previous symptoms or sign. Listen for abnormal signs like asymmetry, fix uh, monophonic wheeze, you know, monophonic one, okay? And there's a whoosh, whoosh, rather, rather, you know, okay, chest x ray can be abnormal and it's difficult in younger children, of course. You have to have expiratory. But on history, basically on history alone, we do bronchoscopy, which is rigid bronchoscopy. This is not all children, you know, things they might have, uh, you know, carrots, peanuts, um, uh, 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 rice, all these things, okay? Um, beans, 
Um, and uh, so it, it's not necessarily uh, opacities, okay? Op, uh, opac uh, you know, so it, it, it may not be, it might be just loosened and you're gone. So in, in good X-ray, expiratory and in, inspiratory and expiratory, you will see the retention, okay? For the foreign body. This is borrowed and this repeat what I said, uh, that's that's based on the BTS guidelines of things. Okay, rarely you have vascular rings in a child with barking cuff strider and and difficulty of of swallowing when you have when you have arch. Okay, sometimes, but not necessarily always difficult in swallowing early. You might have strider or difficulty in breathing, and then we do. Uh, barium and of course echocardiogram, okay, and CT, okay. Post bronchiolitis uh, uh, wheezing, very common, very common. You have a child three months old, four months old. The uh, the earlier, the younger, they do they they start uh, have a, a, a cough and cold with tachypnea following cold in in usually winter and autumn, okay. Uh, peak eight months. And no response to medication. Okay, and they cough and wheeze after that. Um, the various studies showed airway inflammation not present, uh, bronchial hyperreactivity probably not, although that's debatable on some. Um, the, they have a pre-existing uh, bronchial uh, sort of uh, narrowing and abnormalities of the airways, and uh, 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 they are prone to viral induced wheeze. But the long longitudinal studies from Melbourne, from Peter Hill, uh, Australia, showed that they eventually they do not develop asthma or lung damage or anything. But but they may become asthmatic only those who have genetic predisposition or atopy at the background. Not, not because of RSV, okay? So we normally wait for a spontaneous response. Uh, w, uh, H, WHO criteria for the uh, integrated maternal and child illness, when you assess a child with respiratory symptoms for developing countries, I thought I'll give you, because you have a lot of rural areas there, I think. They, they say, by the way, um, it, the pneumonia, as as Professor Yahya said, is is, is, is you know is, is very common and, and 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 serious. It you know in children under the age of five years, it's the leading killer in the whole world. Leading killer, one point four million die under the age of five years. Can you imagine? What, every year, every year, eighteen percent of all the deaths of children under the age of five years. That's so. This drove the WHO and UNICEF to develop global action plan for prevention and control of pneumonia. It's called GAP. That's very well known for, for, for in, 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 in promoting hygiene and immunization and early antibiotic in community acquired, in community acquired. Okay, so they say in examination, you must look for the following, that's the WHO, which I already told you about. Okay, look for cyanosis or, or you know, oxygen saturation, grunting. Of course, the pneumonia give you grunting and flaring of alanazi and head bobbing in babies, but in all their children, you know, they, they might grunt, or they might be technique, but without wheezing and without subcostal recession usually, unless they have the empyema and thing. And uh, we look for wheezing and striders, different of course, from pneumonia. Raised jugular, that's for the cardiac fever um, uh, 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 and, and uh, severe uh, uh, palmar pallor and, and fever, etc. Okay, and the examination, uh, these are the normals, you know, children, you know, under the age of, uh, two months of the respiratory rate, more than 60. That's the R technique, two to 11, more than 50. Very technique, one to five years, more than 40. That's WHO. Lower chest wall, indrong, subcostal recession. All these are abnormal findings. And apex peak displacement in, this, in the context of pneumonia, this means you have pleural fusion or atelectasis or empyema, of course, okay? Um, and auscultation, crackles, wheezes, or reduced sounds, etc. Bronchial breathing and gallop rhythm when you have when you are on heart failure as a result. Okay, um, 
percussion, dull, of course, pleural fusion on pyema and hypoallucency and, and pneumothorax. And if you have a complication with heart failure, you will end up with gallop rhythm, heart murmurs, plus, plus, if you have a heart failure, you won't have a heart failure without large heart or anhepatomegaly. You will have them, okay? And so abdomen, uh, you have hepatomegaly. Sometimes you can have supinomegaly, okay? Um, of course, um, now, do uh, clinical features tell you whether this is viral or bacterial? Uh, the likely etiological agent cannot be uh, predicted from clinical feature unless, as I said earlier, the younger the child, the higher the temperature, there is a good association and various, and various studies shows that it is, it, it is bacterial or associated with bacteremia. And the, you go back to the journal with pediatrics and pediatrics and other uh, 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 studies, evidence-based. Viral pneumonia cannot be accurate, accurately uh, distinguished from bacterial sometimes on a clinical picture. I'm afraid even viral pneumonia can give you high temperature and, 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 and uh, pleural fusion, et cetera. But usually it doesn't give you the empyema as much as the uh, bacterial. Preschool children, if we present primary bacterial pneumonia, is unlikely. This is a common thing. In a preschool child, if we see, and usually have a very low grade fever, these children. Unless if you have a high fever, this means the asthma uh, complicated by pneumonia, by atelectasis or thing. Children um, with bacteremia and pneumonia are more unwell also. They say the, sick, the child is sick. Looking at the child, the child is he or she sick looking, okay, ill looking, okay. Um, other, other features, tachypnea is a good indicator of lower respiratory tract infection. Tachypnea, upper respiratory, doesn't, doesn't give you much. That's the WHO criteria, and I'm not going to go through again these things. Um, um, the, they say the diagnosis of pneumonia cannot be just a clinically. You need radiological or ultrasound finding, or ultrasound finding, and presence of normal clinical signs on chest usually make pneumonia unlikely in an older child. Some younger children can be misleading, and you can have early pneumonia but normal signs in less than uh, less than the age of three years. Okay, pulse oximetry as a guide, you know, whether to stop oxygen in, in, in children when you are an inpatient or, 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 or treating at home. Chest exode pneumonia associated with complications. Um, when you have lack of response to medication, uh, you must suspect something else, providing you are following the guidelines and giving the right antibiotic for the right duration. As Professor Yahya said, you don't just change just like that. K keep uh, or, or doing, uh, uh, um, you know, keep changing without, uh, uh, you know, unnecessarily. And um, so you need to give adequate amount, okay? And, and, and look at, uh, look at uh, 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 you know, uh, if the child has uh, suspicious changes on x-rays, either you think about something else. Um, in favor of bronchitis, uh, infant less than the age of one year, recent chorizal symptoms, tachypnea, subcostal recession, crackles and wheeze, low grade temperature. Okay, uh, variable severity, of course. You can have bad bronchitis in some. In favor of pneumonia, cough, chest pain, grunting, nasal flaring, tachypnea, fever, coarse crackles, and head nodding in children or bobbing, okay, in children, in infants, or, or onion. Um, when you have a cardiac failure, raised sometimes JVP displays epics, uh, gallop rhythm, heart uh, murmur, basal fine uh, uh, crackles, hepatomegaly, anemia. You can have severe pallor, so anemic children, and especially when hemoglobin less than six gram, etc. Um, congenital heart disease, you have cyanosis, but in children, cyanotic congenital heart disease they rarely have heart failure because it's the pulmonary stenosis which prevent the heart failure. But of course, they can have pneumonias, like any other child, entitled to have pneumonia, especially those who have uh, T-cell deficiencies, or such as 22Q uh, 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 deletion, et cetera, okay? Or, or other children, just normally. Uh, 
uh, Down syndrome are at a high risk of uh, uh, pneumonitis as well. Um, so congenital heart disease, they give you feeding difficulties, pattern, get pitosis, give you paroxysmal cough, vomiting well in between, clear chest, conjunctival hemorrhage, immunization, no, okay. Um, TB, when you have a prolonged cough, weight loss, wasting, history of contact, contact, no BCG, or you have a positive, disproportionate positive man too, even if you have a BCG, disproportionate positive sputum culture or gastric aspirate. For him, buddy, I gave you the, the, uh, the, the causes for it. All these are differential diagnoses, okay? Uh, in bronchiolitis, usually it's a symptomatic treatment. Oxygen, feeding, and supportive, and we, did, we give, um, uh, you know, OptiFlow now and CPAP, et cetera. I'm not gonna go through the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, treatment of bronchiolitis here. Um, um, all these, I'm not going to go through these things, actually. These are the evidence for not, not, nothing well. But in no pneumonia, you know, home care, um, just soothe the throat and relief. That's for upper respiratory tract infection. With uh, cough with safe remedy, uh, advice mother when to return. You must educate the parents. Follow up in five days if not improving. And if coughing more than two weeks, consider other diagnoses, e.g. asthma, etc. Uh, if it is mild pneumonia, the, the guidelines, whether BTS, WHO, you give the penicillin in the group, the amoxicillin, but now there is a major, uh, there is a concern among res resistance to uh, 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 an, an, an emergence of beta-lactamase, okay, bacteria. So that's why coamoxiclav, uh, it's is now being used more widely than than just you starting with amoxicillin and some, okay. Microlyze only only if no response and low grade fever. And you think of atypical pneumonia, never first uh, uh, line, okay. Soothe the throat and relieve cough and safe remedy and advise mother went to return immediately. Follow up in two days or so. I thought I'll just give you. This is the guide, you know, guideline for pneumonia, management of community-acquired pneumonia in infants and children. That's a huge, a huge study of 4,900, et cetera. Recommend amoxicillin, but there's emergence of a lot of, uh, 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 you know, uh, of, of, of uh, uh, resistance. So they are using almost coamoxiclav as a first line, okay, in, in, in many. And we have... If you, I don't know that you are aware of the pediatric guidelines uh, uh, group partners in pedi it's called PIP, pediatrics, uh, you know, in in uh, you know partners in pediatrics. Uh, they use wide, lots of hospitals in UK and Europe uh, follow this because all evidence based. They they use again from different age group respiratory tract hospital acquired pneumonia, empyema, the um, uh, coamoxiclav there, okay? And then, as I said, only when you are allergic to penicillin, use cipro or clindamycin and, uh, and, and, and in those bronchiectasis, you give mac macrolides, et cetera, or because they're anti-inflammatory effect in lichen cystic fibrosis, et cetera. Um, a treatment, uh, the, this is the uh, non-specific cough approach, approach to non-specific cough, okay? Um, the, in inhaled beta-2 agonist, uh, you use, uh, there's no evidence of, that's evidence-based, by the way, no evidence for mucolytic. You know, you give expectorant over-the-counter cough, uh, the benilina, the antitussive, may feed them. No, antimicrobial for non-specific non, uh, cough, doesn't help except those who have who have uh, uh, element of infection. Okay, when you start with amoxiclav or uh, chronic, um, you, uh, uh, you, you uh, some they may you know the, the, all these. There is no um, uh, uh, effect of of in, inhaled beta two agonist or um, uh, or or. Uh, um, or, or, or methadoxines uh, or 
anti anticholinergics, etc. Except when you have an evidence for atopy or asthma. Now, I just want to touch on quickly on azithromycin misuse. Very, very, very common azithromycin misuse um, in, during COVID-19. Uh, this has been, I'm afraid, raising a great deal of concern all over the world because since um, Trump advertised for it first with the chloroquine and he proved to be wrong, just as he became wrong on the elections, whatever, I don't want to go through the uh, politics, okay? Um, it, this, uh, the ISDA guidelines on treatment and management of patients with COVID Infectious Disease Society of American guidelines, you know, it says that's the that's the conclusion. Okay, it says azithromycin widely utilized in an, as an antibacterial uh, agent, uh, also shown to have uh, in vitro uh, uh, antiviral activity. But it is actually not, you know, it is not among hospitalized patients. Uh, it says. Uh, uh, a recommendation azithromycin versus no hydro, uh, hydroxychloroquine or azithromycin for hospitalized patients have no effect at all, okay? No effect on, these uh, on the children or adults, not only things. So, and uh, azithromycin used in pediatrics, Canadian pediatric society, not only American, it says, uh, again, the conclusion on the azithromycin use in pediatrics overview should not be used azithromycin to treat acute pharyngitis, acute otitis media, or community acquired pneumonia other, and otherwise healthy children, except in the following areas, which are when we, when we use it as an anti-inflammatory, like, for example, in cystic fibrosis, as a prophylaxis sometimes, etc. And the latest alert we had in UK, the latest alert on 15th of December, 15th of December from the chief medical officer. That's 15, that is from the horse mouth, azithromycin, the management of COVID-19. Okay. Um, results of, of the uh, recovery trial, a randomized uh, controlled open label adaptive platform showed no significant effect of from the azithromycin either oral or intravenous on these patients, uh, on the hospitalization or, on the, uh, or, or uh, as an outpatient, okay? So it is therefore now, it is, it is therefore now recommended that azithromycin should not be used in management of confirmed or suspected COVID-19, okay? Um, so action, uh, the action, they are telling us not to use it, okay? They send uh, uh, alert to the NHS trust, means the hospitals and the general practitioner, not to use it, okay? This is the algorithmic follow, we follow how to follow the a child with non-specific cuff, discuss the option, take the history, go for therapy, you know, dry cough, wet cough, et cetera, et cetera, and then you follow, okay? Out, just a flavor, a child present to us an interesting case, nothing to do with infections and things, but just to tell us that we should be uh, considering every possibility. Um, a child with cough and wheeze, um, this child, 12 years old, had an intermittent cough treated with, with asthma for, you know, since the age of two years on solbutamol, and then um, cough and wheeze intermittent with some retrosternal discomfort for 18 months presented to us, given, uh, you know, worse during exercise uh, with occasional cyanosis and uh, on exertion, cyanosis and shortness of breathing. What did we say? Shortness of breathing or sign desaturation, special on exercise, exercise intolerance is a serious thing. He was treated by GP with flexotide and salivant, which is long acting beta 2 agonist, and then they change into uh, uh, salm, uh, you know, uh, 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 serotide, okay, to combine the two. Peak flow rate was very low, 50%. Okay, and then when they uh, 
the family history, you know, there's nothing serious apart from some hay fever in the mother, some allergy. And they've done um, previous history normal, all normal, investigation, full blood count, virology, mycoplasma, thing, all normal, immunoglobulin. Although half does might a topic, but it doesn't give, shouldn't give low peak flow. So we did before and after. Before and after bronchodilator spirometry and showed fixed, no changes in peak flow, no changes at all in an FEV1, no changes. This means there's compression and the chest X-ray showed narrowing of the trachea. So that's the variable expiratory obstructive, it's called variable outside obstruction. And this turned out, we did a barium swallow and this child had narrowing of the esophagus. This child, believe it or not, had double aortic arch all these years without anyone um, thought of doing peak flow pre and post or properly assess or listen to the story. So the treatment was surgical resection, of course, was better, but they had, they had some residual cough because of trachomalacia. I'm not gonna go, so these are what, what I went for, introduction causes differential diagnosis and management. Thank you very much. I'm sorry that uh, it took longer probably than desired. Thank you, Professor Dr. Majid, for your comprehensive and nice presentation, as always. Um, uh, I want to present the third team. If you are SPL or ambicillin C uh, uh, type of resistance, then uh, uh, you might add meropinum. Uh, uh, if you have uh, VRE, then um, maybe peptazo. If you are MESA, then uh, floxacillin, cloxacillin. If you are MERSA, then probably vancomycin. It is very hard unless I know the scenarios. Like these are general guidelines. Yeah. But if you tell me specific scenario, I can help you. Yeah. Uh, it's exogenous surfactant therapy in preterm babies has a protective effect to prevent pneumonia in ICU. It will help the respiratory dysfunction, but it will not prevent the infection. But presence presence of surfactant immunizes the baby against the infection, but giving surfactant will not prevent the infection. Okay. Um, uh, Dr. Yahya, can you differentiate pneumonia depending on severity, very severe pneumonia, severe pneumonia, uh, SWHO classification or only differentiate depend on early and late. I mean, you you uh, you, you can definitely know it's yeah. mild, moderate or not. Depend right. whether you need respiratory support or not, and depending on your imaging, X-ray, lung ultrasound, <coughs> CT scan. Right. And, right. Uh, so yeah, I know you can grade it very easily. Right. You can grade um, it even from another standard. question. Yes. Yeah. Right. Uh, another question: rule of cesarean section in prevent, preventing pneumonia? It depends on the pathogen. If it's herpes right. and it, it is like a primary, not recurrent, uh, the prevention, it can decrease the rate of transmission from probably 30 to 70 down to 5%. So it depends on the pathogen, actually. Cesarean right. section may be protected, but most of time it is not. Uh, what are the means to reduce the risk of ventilation-induced pneumonia? Or oh, it is, uh, you have to use the Kevin Willer evidence, the meta-analysis, Kevin Willer with Peter Davis from Australia, from Tasmania, they did a very nice meta-analysis. And since then we're starting to use volume limited, pre pressure limited, volume targeted ventilation or elective high frequency. Now how to use, you need the training. Right, uh, how GBS can lead to pneumonia? Uh, two pathways, they have the hemolysine, they can invade, damage, injure the, the airways and go inside, or they can come from the blood to the lung. Um, antiviral of choice in neonatal viral pneumonia. Depend on the type, acyclovir for uh, herpes and gancyclovir or vangalicin for cytomegalo, especially the congenital. They acquired 
of cytomegalo is very limited evidence, but the congenital, um, it, it, it lots of help, especially for the hearing deficiency. Um, another question from one of the doctors, interventional uh, pulmonologist in Iran. Uh, uh, what's the COVID-19 pneumonia condition among, among us neonates in your area? Very, uh, very uh, tiny numbers. And if they are there, they're mostly asymptomatic. Um, and, and the symptoms are mild. I do have now, right now, two patients. Uh, they're very light, little of tachypnea, uh, but most of the time is asymptomatic. Uh, we, there is a very nice uh, uh, international classification done by Dr. Shah uh, from Canada, uh, where they grade uh, infection to seven grades, depending on the uh, symptomatology of the mother and the symptomatology of the baby and other factors. Uh, and uh, the, uh, so there are very nice classification, Dr. Shah. If you Google it, you will find it's uh, open source and uh, nice grading and classification if you are interested to read it. Uh, Professor Dr. Majid, do you, uh, get, do you have a comment on, on such uh, COVID in, in, in neonates? Do you have uh, any data in UK about? Well, in, in, in UK, we have not uh, seen, like any other countries, um, lots of uh, COVID-related high morbidity or mortality is actually remain it actually remain very low um, and uh, um, the it, it's it's uh, it, it's an age group that really for some reason or other just um, are escaping the the this this uh, nasty uh, virus um, the the only exception of course in older children where we have we talked about uh, uh, pediatric multisystem inflammatory disorder uh, syndrome which uh, it's a completely different entity, as you know. Um, thank you, thank you. Um, there is a question. Uh, um, the, then the new, in neonates admitted in the PR, in the neonatal uh, unit, uh, uh, how about the cannula? Does it uh, make the patient to be infected? <laughs> no. They're very... <laughs> No, yeah. peripheral, you mean peripheral cannula or central? Yes, yes, yes. They yeah. ask about no. peripheral cannula. Okay. Suppose not. It's suppose not. But That's I a think, question comes. Yeah, yeah, I don't think it causes, but if you use a proper disinfection, uh, if you limit the trial to two trials per person, but if you keep puncturing the baby, of course, it will give you some risk. Uh, but uh, in term babies, I don't think it affects. In very small babies, less, less than one kilo, it might if you do many punctures. So that's why it's better to go to UAC and UVC in these small babies than and yeah. go right to its central line than, than other than trying uh, many uh, trials. But in general, no. Um, another question for late onset pneumonia. Do we, do, do we need to check renal function before starting vancomycin or amikacin? Well, no, you need to check the renal function without even antibiotics. You cannot start a patient with pneumonia. You need, uh, most of these patients, they have respiratory problems, so you need the fluid. If you need the fluid, then you need renal function because you need to know sodium, whether a baby is dehydrated or not, whether he's hyper, hypo, or uh, normal, uh, natrimic, and you need to know the renal function, so you decide how much fluid you give. And uh, so, of course, without even antibiotics, you need the renal function. Um, and, and then if you uh, want to start antibiotics, you know, vancomycin are also guided by the renal function. So uh, right. those, um, so it's without of say, you need to do a renal function. I mean, uh, another question linked to vancomycin is that it's the linezolid anti antibiotics is effective against the vancomycin resistant strains? I don't think there is connection. It might be, uh, but linozolid is a good choice uh, if the uh, other alternatives are not working. But there is no direct connection that you should use linozolid and vancomycin. Uh, I rarely need uh, linozolid, rarely ever, like maybe once, three, three, four times I've used it in my life. Uh, vancomycin, I always, my second line, when we late or there is a central line, uh, but linozolid, I rarely use it. Okay. Um, uh, another question maybe for both speakers. Do you consider performing multiplex 
PCR for respiratory panel routinely for uh, uh, babies less than three months presenting with respiratory symptoms? I will leave that to Dr. Majid. I will answer after. Yes, Professor, Dr. Oh, Majid. I, I, I was answering I'm, questions, I beg pardon, so. Oh, oh uh, just, uh, I, I will repeat the question again. Do you consider performing multiplex PCR for respiratory panel routinely for babies less than three months presenting with respiratory symptoms? Well, um, we, we normally do um, for, uh, in a dip, for example, in winter and autumn, we do for bronchiolitis, okay, um, for the RSV. I mean, um, for those who have, uh, um, uh, you know, it, uh, uh, for those who have, for example, uh, pertussiform cough or thing or no immunization, or uh, where we, we use the, um, you know, the, the, the pertussis, you know, but uh, PCR as such in a mild cases as a routine, we don't normally in a, in a child who's well, okay, even okay. even if he's young, right. we don't use right. it as well. agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I totally agree. Yes. I um, only if I have a suspicion of a virus, I will do it, or mm -hmm. uh, we use the what we call it panel, a virology panel five five, yeah. five seven thirteen. Only if you are very endemic, you know, let's say Dr. Majid received 15 babies with the same problem. Yeah. Then I start to investigate. But for common workup and especially mild, if exactly. you need a respiratory support and you have no bacterial infection, you probably need to look the reason because you might have some antiviral. Let's say if you want to diagnose RSV um, and you need to give it up, you know. So routinely, no, we don't do it. Okay. Uh, so about respiratory support, Dr. Itawi, uh, they ask about the correct steps about respiratory support. What do you mean okay. by correct respiratory? It is very hard to answer, but always remember principles. Yeah. Do use blended oxygen, no pure oxygen. So One. just explain for them what's blended because there is another question it's about blending. Air oxygen blender. Yes. So it connects, there is two tubes, one is black and one is yellow, yellow, and you have either central, and you should, every hospital has to have a compressor that generate medical airs. And usually these compressors are either four, eight or 16, half working and half stopping. And then they switch every 12 hours or 24 hours to keep working. And medical air is different from air by it's filtered, it is uh, uh, sterilized, and then you have air oxygen blender from the two tubes, it mix. So you have two gauge to dial. There is the air and there is the oxygen. So you have oxygen set. And then by mixing, there is a table that you can use and it will tell you how much pressure, how much oxygen going to the baby at the uh, oropharynx. And remember, we are human being, we breathe only 21%. We cannot give more than 21%, only temporarily. So if you need persistently to give uh, oxygen more than 40%, then you have to escalate. So you give the oxygen, that's called oxygen delivery system. You can give it by mask and the masks are of different type, Venturi mask, non-rebreathing, rebreathing mask, and so on. You can give it with a, a nasal cannula. You can give it with, uh, you know, you can escalate self-inflation, flow inflation, uh, you can give it with uh, uh, high flow, normal flow, low flow, micro flow. Uh, you can give it with non-invasive uh, ventilation. And then you go with CPAP, uh, advanced or by CPAP, and then conventional ventilation, and then high frequency. So yeah. it really, need, you need a, like a, a training course or a fellowship. Series of lectures. <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree. I'm afraid, by the way, this is a common question for the membership and the exam. And we have videos even of infants and they give you a scenario of jowl bronchiolitis and on OptiFlow, for example. OK, and they give you the rate, say, liter per kg, something like that. And the rate and the percentage of exam say, uh, what's the next? Okay, so that's very important to, to see whether you can go for to for CPAP, for example, or or or, or IPPV, etc. So this is a 
there are various scenarios. We can present cases actually in these things. It might be very nice to have a session on presenting cases. You know? So I do have, Dr. Majid, I, ho I do have the adaptive test lung. Yeah. So I can create uh, high, high um, resistance, low compliance, high yeah. compliance mix. So I can present, if you guys are interested yeah. uh, with you, yeah. I can create a scenario like a bronchiolitis scenario, asthma. Exactly. We do. Uh, I can create scenarios on the ventilator. I have it and you I see? can present it. We can do a course if you interest for MRCV. Exactly. About, you know, exactly. Audience, audience will be more interested to see the live case, you know, cases, especially when they have all the, you know, answered emergencies, okay, so that they then don't get into trouble in real life. I, I do that. I do that three times a week for my nurses at mm -hmm. 9 p.m., 9 a.m., um, three weeks, and then I create scenario and a sudden, I don't tell them, yeah. okay, yeah. this is the, this is the case, this is the manage. Exactly. Okay. Yes, we do. Then we do I observe too. and record, and then I give my comments. So I always yeah. create these scenarios or drills. Yeah. But yeah. if Dr. Majid are interested, I we can, I am, I'm, you know, we, we can do a joint uh, course. Because there are yeah. certain cases with cardiac problems as well, you know, as you know, and uh, associated yeah. with uh, complicated by respiratory problem, what to do, or else yeah. they, these guys go into trouble. So I don't want to complicate things. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, another question is uh, most common organisms in late infection uh, in gram negative uh, infections. Well, it depends on the country and yeah. it depends on the uh, community. So uh, the problem with the community, uh, not like with the hospitalized, because with the hospitalized, we do lots of cultures and swap. So we know the colonization. In community, we don't know the colonization. We know only the cultures. And the problem you face that people will start antibiotics without cultures. So that make it more worse. You don't know the resistance, you don't know the susceptibility, and you don't know whether this is viral or... Maybe this is a connection. One number. Yeah, that yeah. In last month, I used antibiotics in my clinic two times. One month two antibiotics only, one time uh, augmenting and one time uh, azithromycin, only, only two times. And I have between five to 15 patients a day, mm. only two times antibiotics. Perfect. When um, does any patient with broom more than 18 hours need admission and waiting for three or waiting for three days and culture if culture is not available, what's your opinion? With the crew, sorry, with the crew? No, prom. Prom. So with prom, mm -hmm. the answer is no. So you don't admit any baby, even if he was born in the toilet. You don't admit babies based on the risk. The baby yeah. has to be symptomatic. However, however, if you have risk of sepsis, you keep the baby in the hospital for 48 hours, you might do CBC, and you do vital sign every six hours. If the CBC showed white PC below 5,000 or more than 30,000, you repeat. If it's persistently higher or below, then based on risk factor, you might do sepsis workup. Now remember very important golden principle. It's always right to start antibiotics, but it's always wrong to continue antibiotics if the patient is asymptomatic and it's past 48 hours after culture, because 24 hours culture, yield of culture is uh, 71%, 36 hours the yield is 85%, while uh, 48 hours the yield is up to 96%. So if 48 hours pass, then you are sure 96% there is no bacteremia. Now, if you add to it, there is no clinical symptom, then you probably sure 99%. And remember, antibiotics cause resistance. Antibiotics cause necrotizing enterocolitis. Okay, antibiotics increase the mortality and morbidity rate of neonatal right. care. Right. Um, there's another question, uh, mostly neonatology, doctor. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. As neonatologist. I, I, I took the show from you, Dr. Majid. <laughs> don't, don't worry, don't worry. Don't worry. I'm, I'm happy for you too. You know, we learn. Okay, don't worry. As, as uh, neonatologists, we face the pneumonia in ventilated, in ventilated babies. 
okay. what's your experience in the diagnostic criteria and how to do to do differentiate real pneumonia from colonized ET tube? Uh, very, very difficult to answer. So if you do culture and you find uh, colonization, is it with or without white BC? So if you see white BC in your cultures, then our inflammatory cells, then that would help. And the X-ray finding, that would help too. Lung ultrasound finding, that would help too. And if you are escalating your ventilation, so let's say if you are on PEEP of five or six, and then you need to increase your PEEP to nine or 10 or 12, and uh, your tidal volume is increasing and your CO2 is accumulating and you don't have PDA or you don't have cardiac problem, then you probably real deal with, uh, with VAB or ventilator associated pneumonia. Uh, you look at all the graphs. So the graphs and loops, as you know, the ventilation is revolutionized after start we have uh, uh, loops and graph graphics. It adds lots of information to you. So most of the uh, in real infection cause uh, decreased compliance. So, and then if you do the dynamic compliance and also you do C20 over uh, dynamic compliance and it's more than one, then you're probably dealing with right infection. It is very hard to answer this question because I have to show it to you. Um, so I use the loops and the graphics, the inflammatory cells inside the lung ultrasound. Um, it, it helps lots. Uh, 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 and, and, and uh, it is within the context of the situation. So what exactly the situation, the postnatal age, the gestation and so on. Uh, but it is very difficult situation, but with the current monitoring tools, uh, we can diagnose it. Thank you, Dr. Yahya. Uh, a question to Dr. Jawad. Pneumonia with high temperature means having bacteremia or septicemia? No, well, uh, Septicemia is a situation when you have uh, more circulatory and all sorts of things, you know, changes. Bacteremia comes first, you know, when they say, you know, so, well, it's the definition is that when you have bacteria and the blood is bacteremia. Septicemia is, a, is if you like, an, an, an extension to this when you end up with, uh, with various um, uh, multi-system changes, etc. Okay. So, so, it doesn't matter when you, if you are febrile and unwell and you have a positive blood culture, okay, um, then, then, then you qualify for antibiotic anyway, okay? Uh, whether it, it wouldn't make difference to the management bacteria of to the definition. But of course, the child or anyone will need support accordingly if they have other system uh, uh, if you like, um, uh, other systems affected, for example, compensatory respiratory to, uh, you know, to, uh, 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 to respiratory failure to a circulatory failure, something like that, or vice versa. So you have to support the systems that's in septicemic child. For example, uh, and a common example, if you have a severe pneumonia, just like, just like uh, 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 meningococcal septicemia, okay? It can give you septicemia. So it can give you circulatory failure, for example, okay? And our respiratory consequences as well, or respiratory and complicated by, uh, by uh, circulatory. Then you need support, okay? You need support both circulatory, ventilatory, according to the degree, of course, okay? All right? Whereas in bacteremia, that's the beginning of it. You have the positive culture and things, okay? And then you, you may not need the support except for antibiotic and simple other measures. Right. So. Right. Um, Dr. Mir I, 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 had, I had a few uh, questions I had to respond to. Some yes. of them say, you did not recommend azithromycin, so what else? What does it mean? I answered, I said, in what context? Is it in a child with COVID? We don't use anything if it is a child with COVID and he's well, okay? Right. You wait and see. You don't have to use azithromycin. Please don't, don't go, don't induce resistance un unnecessarily. We, you know, the microbiologists all over the world, the, their worst nightmares is the antibiotic resistance in the future. 
So don't start abusing these things unnecessarily, okay? And the other question was related to Monte Lucas, yes, the use yes. of Monte Lucas. And I did answer that, but Monte Lucas is used in, in summary as an add on, step three in asthma, okay? As an add on, okay, to steroid and long acting beta to agonist, or in younger infants and children with recurrent wheeze, yes, there is a role for it. And there has been many studies showed that you can use it even intermittently for a week during that week of the, or two weeks and stop. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I have no shares in the company, so don't worry. Uh, but I'm just telling you various studies showed this. Uh, or ideally, it's a, it's sometimes we use it here in UK from October to March in children with recurrent cough, cough and wheeze, okay? Uh, because it was found to be uh, useful in some, okay. Thank you, Dr. Majid. Um, I will comment one thing here, Dr. Rahan. I don't yes. recommend any antibiotics for COVID-19 or any antiviral. I yeah. don't think we should use. Which, I think the most important is to prevention and when develop respiratory support. That's the point, respiratory support. Yeah. Uh, I don't think there is enough evidence and we know it's viral. Yeah. Apart from herpes and cytomegalovirus, I personally, and HIV combination, yeah, I yeah. personally don't think any virus has any antiviral. Now we agree on this. And right. It's agree. evidence based now. I agree. Um, uh, I think uh, we finished all the questions. Uh, and if you have, if you just, I maybe I missed one. I just go through all, maybe. Um, any questions? Maybe not answer, Dr. Yahya, Dr. Majid. Any um, more comments the, if you want to maybe, add? Maybe we can allow the audience to ask live a question if you want. Yeah, yeah. Um, if anybody want to ask uh, live questions, uh, we are ready for answering. Probably they are asleep now. <laughs> <laughs> now, now uh, yeah, a lot of people are watching us, Dr. Majid. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. There's uh, a quite, hopefully. I'm very impressed with the number still, still watching. Yeah. Very impressed, to be honest. We don't have this many in UK that do this. <laughs> right, right. Well, you, we have you, Dr. Majid, we have you, so they have to stay. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you very much. That's very noble indeed, of you. Indeed, uh, indeed Dr. Majid. Thanks, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, just, just one. Well, uh, if you allow me, maybe. Oh, sorry, Doctor. If you keep it yes. open, I'm going to send the, the certificate or the presentation to people. So if you keep it open, because they're asking for a presentation, and I'm just uh, copying and pasting and sending it. So if you keep the panel open until I do that. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, the Doctor Yahya, Doctor Majid. Um, just a question. Although it's um, maybe far away from uh, day, our, our day presentation, but COVID pneumonia is less common than in adult yes. in children, I mean. That's, yes, the studies from China, from um, Brazil, South Africa, UK, showed is much lower, the presentation right. much lower than adults, absolutely. Yeah. Actually, even those, when they go to have the multi-system, you know, the right. Pediatric yeah. multisystem inflammatory disorder. Only 36% they have the respiratory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The more, more common gastrointestinal, believe it or not. Yeah. No. Um, here, here we notice that it's mostly fever and yeah. gastrointestinal, yeah. less yeah. commonly the chest yeah. problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. I um, any questions if uh, for, for the participants? Uh, if you have any question, you can ask directly. I'm, I'm happy for my email to go. Uh, if, if they want anything, uh, I'll be very happy to, to, to answer things. Or uh, okay. I'll try also to send some uh, PDF things they send me. Oh, they ask for the uh, presentation in PDF. Maybe yeah. the uh, I don't know, in some way to send to those asking for uh, for that. Maybe the I'm company right now I'm can doing do... it. I'm, I'm doing it for my presentation. Oh, okay, nice. nice. Copying and pasting all the emails. So if you give um, me like... Dr. Yahya, oh, one question maybe we missed to answer. Okay. Is yes. Is antibiotics in mode of syrup 
will be effective in neonate? No. Okay, this is one part of the question. IV, IV, remember, yes. IV. Uh, no, okay. I am no oral, IV. And, uh, and there's uh, there another question, part of the same question. Um, should be treated for, uh, should be uh, the treatment continue for 10 to 14 days, IV, or we can switch to oral? IV. Just IV, IV. for 14 days? IV, no oral, no oral, okay. IV. Okay, that's why we are interested. No, that's it. So just uh, two questions coming in the end. If you don't need IV, then you probably don't need antibiotics. Okay. So when they discharge the patient without antibiotic? Yes, the, your patient, you cannot go home and there is pneumonia. You have to resolve the pneumonia yes. before the patient yes, sure. goes home. Because, you, you know, here, routine in Iraq, as I, uh, we are working here, we know that. So when the patient discharged from neonatal unit, so discharge with the syrup of the antibiotic. <laughs> well, first, I don't, I don't like the word routine. There is no routine. In no, no, here, they are doing it. And so that's why we are doing this. I don't like it. Maybe the yeah. Majid can comment on that. Yeah. And you cannot send baby home, a neonate, less than three months, home, and there is, you think there is a pneumonia. If you think there is a pneumonia, you should not send the patient home. The, the, right. there is, the pneumonia has to resolve before you go home. Because the most important is the respiratory support, not the antibiotics. Right. So if you send home with oral, you probably don't need the antibiotics. Yeah, absolutely agree. Okay. But here they are doing that. That's why you are presenting such a presentation to, to just make things better. I mean, the management in the right way. Yeah. Um, um, uh, another question coming is, is, is it safe to administer co -amox amoxiclav to a child under the age of one year who has pneumonia with acute renal failure? Um, uh, yes, Victor, uh, yeah. uh, can I, yes. Uh, yeah, please. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, this is a very uh, important question uh, regarding the dosing of comoxiclav. The in 457, we can give it safely till the GFR is 30 mil or below. Uh, in this case, it's we should avoid comoxiclav in case of GFR below 30. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, can I? Can I say something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a question from Benny Rama, Ramachandra. It says, how can we differentiate between bronchiolitis, viral induced wheeze, and pneumonia? I mean, I, this is, uh, says also the evidence says beta agonists not helpful bronchiolitis. Uh, well, uh, the, the three, uh, two of them definitely distinct. The, uh, bronchiolitis and viral induced wheeze are viral, but the bronchiolitis refers to specific vi usual, not necessarily specific virus, but usually time of the year, Ataman winter, usually young infants who uh, 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 mostly have RSV bronchiolitis, but it can be non RSV, so you can have any other virus causing bronchiolitis. So it's like a viral induced wheeze, okay? So so the two are viral, but the, the common thing between them is that in a mild, the vast majority is mild when they don't need any treatment except supportive, okay? okay? Observation and feeding and keeping well hydrated and blah, blah. And I don't want to uh, say what uh, uh, Prof. Yahya also already touched on, but is the, is the respiratory support only depends on the progression. Okay, um, uh, viral induced wheeze is usually, uh, usually uh, more frequent and can happen at any time, and but can happen also in winter and can be confused with the bronchiolitis, of course. Uh, uh, usually it's not referred to RSV, okay? Uh, although RSV can cause viral induced uh, wheeze, of course, okay? Uh, and uh, it can happen uh, frequently. 
a typical child usually, older children also, uh, preschool, go to nursery, they get cold, goes down to their chest, they start cough and wheeze. Four or five days, they are better, okay? Either of them, uh, you know, in viral induced wheeze, we tend sometimes they are wheezing in an older child. We tend to try some uh, either anticholinergic or like uh, ibotropin bromide or solbutamol. Yes, it is, there is a place in some cases, I'm afraid, okay? Um, although in the majority they are self limiting, okay? But those who have a background of asthma or atopy, when you are not sure, especially if they have allergy to milk or eggs, which is a predisposition, or eczema, uh, or a family history of mother with eczema, especially because it's more intimate relationship with the child, then bronchodilators are very worthwhile to try, okay? Including even Montelukar sounds to try, it's true. As for pneumonia, the difference and A, in the, the temperature in pneumonia, more commonly higher than in, bronch in, in uh, viral induced, okay? They are, have no other low grade. They don't usually have wheezing, no, the others, viral, uh, bronchiolitis, viral induced wheezing, okay? Uh, a young infant, they have a planning of alanazi and head bobbing, all their children and grunting, all their children look ill and grunt. Or, or they have tachypnea without wheezing again. And um, the clinical signs on auscultation different also. And of course, the radiological, especially if you have a high temperature, you must do a chest, you know, uh, uh, investigations, okay? You can't just, just clinically say, well, this is pneumonia and go home if, if you have a child sick with high temperature, okay? You need to see whether this a pneumonia plus minus complications or whatever. Okay, so that's the main differentiation. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Um, I'm going to add something here, Doctor uh, Majid. Um, I think, um, and I'm very confident of that. Lung ultrasound can not only differentiate between asthma and bronchiolitis and pneumonia; it can tell you the severity of bronchiolitis, and it can differentiate between asthma and bronchiolitis, and it definitely can differentiate from pneumonia. And pneumonia can help you lots differentiating between bacteria and viral. So if you wanna really wanna know that, you have to join the course. It's really good course. I'm not because I'm not giving it, but you can ask the people who attended the course. Um, it's interesting, Dr. Isawi. Um, uh, another uh, question, is there is a, a change in a definition of early neonatal sepsis? The early neonatal sepsis depending on the place. So it, uh, the difference is on the uh, uh, first line antibiotics uh, or the second line. And the second, in the first, we do only one blood culture, one site blood culture. In the uh, uh, late, we do two sites blood culture. And the difference, of course, the pathogen and risk factors. So some people use 24, some people use, uh, you know, the extremist use 24 or seven days. The modernist, they use three days. So maybe 24, maybe six days, maybe three days, depend on the location and your practice. Okay, uh, how about ciftriaxone in the pneumonia in, in newborn? Um, Cifotaxin is not different from ciftriaxone. Um, you can still use it, I'm not against it, um, if there is indication or the sensitivity. But as a gassing therapy, uh, we know that there is loss of resistance, loss of bacteria, and they can if there is no resistance, they can develop resistance during the course. So a combination of ambicillin and gentamicin or vancomycin and gentamicin for inpatient as a late or um, gentamicin, uh, I mean, I mean, vancomycin and amikacin, I think would be the best uh, starting guessing therapy. Um, Dr. Majid, and, uh, somebody asking, please, can you tell us if there is any safe cuff suppressant in neonate or pediatric age group? Safe separate, I'm afraid, uh, uh, if we are following the evidence-based medicine, the, there's, there's no recommendation of any cough suppressants or things, I'm afraid. But um, um, uh, codeine is being used in some cases, codeine-containing um, 
uh, sort of uh, cup suppers and in 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 uh, some children with the non-specific cup. Non, I'm not talking about the infectious one or things. So you know, so there's no harm of using it. And even the WHO and developing countries advise some of this cup seal as soothing or whatever. Okay, so this is the short of it. Yeah. Um... Why not? Yeah, the, yes. Yes. Yeah, there, there is anonymous attendee who's asking, uh, "Can I use the ventilator CPAP mode instead of CPAP device?" Uh, I think he wrongly using the wording. I think he meant ventilator. Uh, can I answer the question? Yeah. Yeah. Please. So the ventilator CPAP, or what we call ventilator uh, generated CPAP, called constant CPAP. You know, to prevent, to create pressure. Pressure is the speed of flow, while the volume is the time of the flow. So to, to open a door, you need to push it quickly and strongly to get the pressure. So uh, the ventilator creates the pressure by, uh, by compressor going to the baby and then coming back to the expiratory valve. So the baby will breathe against all this long, serve, uh, long uh, column of pressure. And therefore, ventilator uh, uh, delivered constant CPAP are used temporarily. What you need to know is the uh, not CPAP because some of the CPAP are also constant flow. You need to use what we call it variable flow CPAP, such as Arabella, such as Hamilton, such as VSS, such as Mido, such as Fabian. There are many. These they use something called fluidic flip principles. Okay, they have a generator at the nose. The most important is the generator. So when the baby breathes in, the pressure goes in. When the baby breathes out, the pressure goes out. The baby will not breathe against the machine. And therefore you can put the baby on CPAP for a long time. And by the way, that is true in the adult. And that's why we see in Iraq failure of CPAP because they use, they think all CPAP are the same. They are not. You have to use a fluidic flip with a generator. To, for long-term CPAP. If you're using transport, you can use uh, the ventilator constant flow CPAP with ram cannula or with nasal mask or nasal prong. That does not important. But if Dr. you- Dr. Yeah, yeah, for how long do you mean? For how long do you mean? So if you want to use it for less than 24 hours, you can okay. use the ventilator. Okay, okay. But if you want to use it for 14 days, 21 days, uh, you know, I have babies 24 weeks or 24 weeks. Right. 600 grams are right. on CPAP. Right. So, but it's a variable plus CPAP. And you have to cycle between prong and mask so you don't cause a nasal damage. Okay? So please, you have to understand the machine when you want to use it. Don't just go and use the machine. You right. need a training. A pro and you need to know the principles. Okay? Because you need to know why you are failing. Okay? So one of the revolution of neonatology is variable flow CPAP. Variable flow CPAP using the print, right in the Google fluidic flip or write CPAP generator, CPAP nose generator, and you will have the pictures th that you will see. Sorry about that, huh? Okay. Um, another question is high dose Coamox versus low, uh, low dose 40 milligram per kg. That's a question to Dr. Noor. Uh, thanks uh, for your question. Uh, uh, we know now uh, most of the cases uh, that are treated with Comoxiclav, the, the guideline recommend uh, the 45 milligram. However, uh, in case of acute otitis media, uh, we have two opinions here. The American Academy of Pediatricians recommend the higher dose, 80 to 90 milligram per kg, while the Canadian uh, pediatric society guideline in its latest edition still recommend 45 milligram to 60 milligram. Uh, the, the real difference here, uh, the efficacy against streptococcus pneumonia, they both achieve same efficacy in eradication, penicillin resistance to streptococcus pneumonia. However, we may expect a higher efficacy in, in certain cases against, uh, let's say, H influenza. That's the minor difference here. Uh, um, meanwhile, we expect a lot of diarrhea and adverse effect associated with the 90 milligram and maybe treatment discontinuation. So uh, if we follow the 
the, the Canadian guideline, we can go with 45 to 60 milligram in, in, in most of the infections and with a minimum uh, risk for diarrhea. That's all. Thank you, Dr. Asif. I think there is an internet disconnection with Dr. Asif. Rasa, can you hear us? So, uh, so uh, at the end of uh, our webinar, I, I would like to thank our guest and special thanks for our distinguished speaker, uh, Dr. Majid and Dr. Yahya for their uh, nice and very informative uh, presentation. And for the remaining question, for sure, uh, we will uh, try to send those questions to our esteemed speaker and they they will answer uh, it uh, through email. And uh, wish to see, you soon in, to, uh, to see you soon in our next webinar. So till that time, stay safe and goodbye and have a great night. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Th Thank, Thank you. Much. Uh, so thank you, uh, Noah. Thank you very much. Many thanks. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. We'll be in touch. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sending the presentation. They're asking me.